Preface of the Sea Witch This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jerry Dixon The Sea Witch by Murray Maturin Ballou Preface let the reader peruse the following story with the same spirit in which it was written, and not conceive that it is either a pro-slavery or anti-slavery tale. The peculiar institution which is herein introduced is brought forward simply as an auxiliary, and not as a feature of the story. It is only referred to where the plot and locality upon the slave coast have rendered this necessary, and the careful reader will observe that the subject is treated with entire impartiality. These few remarks are introduced because we desire to appear consistent. Our paper shall neither directly nor indirectly further any sectional policy or doctrine, and in its conduct shall be neutral, free, and independent. Editor of the Flag of Our Union End of Preface Recording by Jerry Dixon one of the sea witch this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by jerry dixon the sea witch by murray maturin Ballou. chapter 1 chapter 1 outward bound our story opens in that broad, far-reaching expanse of water which lies deep and blue between the two hemispheres, some fifteen degrees north of the equator, in the latitude of Cuba and the Cape Verde Islands. The delightful trade winds had not fanned the sea on a finer summer's day for a twelve-month, and the waves were daintily swelling upon the heaving bosom of the deep, as though indicating the respiration of the ocean. It was scarcely a day's sail beyond the flow of the Caribbean Sea, that one of those noblest results of man's handiwork, a fine ship might have been seen gracefully ploughing her course through the sky-blue waters of the Atlantic. She was close-hauled on the larboard tack, steering east-south-east, and to a sailor's eye presented a certain indescribable something that gave her tout rig and saucy air a dash of mystery, which would have set him to speculating at once as to her character and the trade she followed. Few things can be named that more potently change our admiration than a full-sized ship under way, her myriad of ropes, sails, and appointments, all so complete and well-controlled, the power of her volition, the promptness with which she obeys the slightest movement of the helm, the majestic grace of her inclination to the power of the winds, and the foaming prow and long glistening wake, all go to make up the charm and peculiarity of a nautical picture. There is true poetry in such a scene as this, beauty fit to move the heart of an anchorite. No wonder the sailor loves his ship like a mistress. No wonder he discourses of her charms with the eloquence of true love and confiding trust. No landsman can be more enamored of his promised bride. But the craft to which we especially refer at the present writing was a coquette of the first class, beautiful in the extreme and richly meriting the name that her owners had placed in golden letters on her stern, the Sea Witch. She was one of that class of vessels known as Flat Upon the Floor, a model that caused her to draw but little water, and enabled her to run free over a sandbar or into an inlet, where an ordinary ship's longboat would have grounded. She was very long and sharp, with graceful concave lines, and might have measured some five hundred tons, Speed had evidently been the main object aimed at in her construction, the flatness of her floor giving her great buoyancy, and her length ensuring fleetness. These were points that would at once have struck a sailor's eye, as he beheld the ship bowling gracefully on her course by the power of the trade winds that so constantly befriend the mariners in these latitudes. We have said that the Sea Witch was of peculiar model, and so indeed she was. Contrary to the usual rig of what are called clipper ships, her masts, instead of raking, were perfectly upright, for the purpose of enabling her to carry more press of sail when need be, and to hold on longer when speed should be of vital importance. That the straighter construction of the mast furthers this object is a fact long since proven in naval architecture. 
She was very low, too, in her rigging, having tremendous square yards, enabling the canvas to act more immediately upon the hull, instead of operating as a lever aloft and keeping the ship constantly off an even keel. Though low in the waist, yet her ends rose gracefully in a curve towards the terminations fore and aft, making her very dry on either the quarter-deck or forecastle. She might have numbered fifty men for her crew, and if you had looked in board over her bulwarks, you would have seen that her complement was made up of men. There were none there but real able-bodied seamen, sea-dogs, who had roughed it in all weather, and on all sorts of allowance. There was a quiet and orderly mien about the deck and among the watch that spoke of the silent yet potent arm of authority. The men spoke to each other now and then, but it was in an undertone, and there was no open levity. A few men were lounging about the hill of the bowsprit on the forecastle. One or two were busy in the waist, coiling cable. An officer of second or third cast, a quiet but decided character, to judge from his features, stood with folded arms just abaft the mizzenmast, and a youthful figure, almost too young seemingly for so responsible a post, leaned idly against the monkey rail, near the sage old tar who was at the helm. At first you might have supposed him a supercargo, an owner's son as passenger, or something of that sort, from the quiet-at-home air he exhibited, but now and then he cast one of those searching and understanding glances aloft and fore and aft, taking in the whole range of the ship's trim, and the way she did her duty, that you realized at once the fact of his position, and you could not mistake the fact that he was her commander. He wore a glazed tarpaulin hat of coarse texture, and his dress was of little better material than that of the crew he commanded, but it set it somehow quite jauntily upon his fine, well-developed form, and there was an unmistakable air of conscious authority about him that showed him to be no stranger to control, or the position which he filled. The hair, escaping in glossy curls from beneath his hat, added to a set of very regular features a fine effect, while a clear, full blue eye, and an open, ingenious expression of countenance, told of manliness of heart and chivalric hardihood of character. Exposure to the elements had bronzed his skin, but there were no wrinkles there, and Captain Will Ratlin could not have seen more than two and twenty years, though most of them had doubtless been passed upon the ocean, for his well-knit form showed him to be one thoroughly inured to service. "'She does her work daintily, Captain Ratlin,' said he who was evidently an officer, and who had been standing by the main mast, but now walked aft. "'Yes, Mr. Faulkner, daintily is the word. I wish our beauty could be a little more spunky.' "'Time is money in our business, sir,' was the prompt reply. "'But the willing craft does all she can, sir.' "'I don't know, Mr. Faulkner. We can make her do almost anything. "'But talk,' added the mate. "'Aye, she will do that in her own way, and eloquently, too,' continued his superior. "'In coming out of Matanzas, when you made her back and feel like a saddle-horse, "'I thought she was little less than a human being,' said the mate honestly. "'She minds her helm like a beauty.' and feels the slightest pull upon her sheets. I never saw a vessel lie closer to the wind, said the mate. She eats right into it, and yet has not taken a foot of canvas this half hour. That is well. It's uncommon, sir, continued the other. She must and can do better, though, said the young commander, with an air of slight impatience. Call the watch below, Mr. Faulkner. We will treat our mistress to a new dress this bright day, and flatter her pride a little. She is of the coquette school, and will bear a little dalliance. Aye, aye, sir, responded the officer, with, without further parley, walking forward to the forehatch, and with a few quick blows with a handspike and a clear call, he summoned that portion of the crew whose hours of release from duty permitted them below. The signal rang sharply through the ship, and caused an instant response. A score of dark forms issued forth from the forecastle, embracing representatives from nearly half the nations of the globe but they were sturdy sailors, and used to obey the word of command, men to be relied upon in an emergency, rough in exterior, but within either soft as women or hard as steel, according to the occasion. Now it was that an observer not conversant with the sea witch, and looking at her from a distance, would have naturally concluded that she was most appropriately named, for how else could her singular maneuvers and the result that followed be explained? 
Suddenly the mizzen royal disappeared, followed by the top gallant sail, top sail, and cross jack courses, seeming to melt away under the eye like a misty veil, while almost in a moment of time there appeared a spanker, gaff top sail, and gaff top gallant sail in their place, while the vessel still held on her course. A moment later in the royal top gallant sail, top sail, and main sail disappear from the main mast upon which appears a regular fore-and-aft suit of canvas, consisting of mainsail, gaff-top sail, and gaff-top gallant sail, reducing the vessel to a square rig forward and a plain fore-and-aft rig aft. A few minutes more, and the foremast passed through the same metamorphosis, leaving the sea witch a three-masted schooner, with fore-and-aft sails on every mast and every stay. All this had been accomplished with a celerity that showed the crew to be no strangers to the maneuvers through which they had just passed, each man requiring to work with marked intelligence. Fifty well-drilled men, thorough sea-dogs, can turn a five-hundred-ton ship inside out if the controlling mind understands his position on the quarter-deck. "'She wears that dress as though it suited her taste exactly, Mr. Faulkner,' said the captain, running his eye over the vessel and glancing over the side to mark her headway. "'Any rig becomes the sea witch,' answered the officer, with evident pride. "'That is true,' returned the captain. "'Luff, sir, luff a bit so well,' he continued to the man at the helm. "'We will have all of her weatherly points that sight will give.' "'The wind is rather more unsteady than it was an hour past,' said Mr. Faulkner. "'Rather puffy, and twice I thought it would haul right about. "'But here we have it still from the northern and eastern.' replied the captain. Here it is again, added the mate, as the wind hauled once more. The immediate object of the change in the vessel's rig, which we have described, was at once apparent, enabling the vessel to lie nearer the wind in her course, as well as giving her increased velocity by bringing more canvas to draw than a square rig could do when close hauled. But a shrewd observer would have been led to ask, what other reason, save that of disguise, could have been the actuating motive in thus giving to the sea witch a double character in her rig. For though temporary and somewhat important advantage could be at times be thus gained, as we have seen, yet such an object alone would not have warranted the increased outlay that was necessarily incurred. To say nothing of the imperative necessity of a vessel's being very strongly manned in order to enable her to thus change her entire aspect with any ordinary degree of celerity, and as had just been accomplished. End of chapter one. Recording by Jerry Dixon, Zephyr Hills, Florida. The Sea Witch. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jerry Dixon. THE SEA WITCH by Murray Maturin Ballou CHAPTER TWO CAPTAIN WILL RATLIN The watch below, after completing the work which had summoned them for the time being on deck, tumbled helter-skelter down the forehatch once more, and left on the deck of the Sea Witch about a dozen able seamen who formed the watch upon deck. A number of these were now gathered in a knot on the forecastle, and while they were sitting cross-legged, picking old rope, and preparing it in suitable form for caulking the ship's seams, one of their number was spinning a yarn, the hero of which was evidently him who now filled the post of commander on board their vessel. The object of their remarks, meanwhile, stood once more quietly leaning over the monkey rail on the weather side of the quarter-deck, quite unconscious that he was supplying a theme of entertainment to the forecastle. There was an absent expression in his handsome face, a look as though his heart was far distant from the scene about him, and yet a habit of watchful caution seemed ever and anon to recall his senses, and his quick keen glance would run over the craft from stem to stern with a searching and comprehensive power that showed him master of his profession, and worthy his trust. Trust? What was the trust he held? Surely no legitimate commerce could warrant the outfit of such a vessel as he controlled, a man of war could hardly have been more fully equipped with means of offense and defense. Amidship, beneath that long boat, was a long heavy metaled gun that worked on a traverse, and which could command nearly every point of the compass while the ship kept her course. 
just inside the rise of the low quarter deck the cabin being entered from the deck by the descent of a couple of steps there were ranged boarding pikes muskets cutlasses and pistols ready for instant use in shape they formed stars hearts and diamonds dangerous but fantastic ornaments the brightness of these arms and the handy way in which they were arranged in the sockets made to receive them showed at once that they were designed for use while the various other fixtures of the cabin and docks plainly bespoke preparation for conflict a strong and lofty boarding netting being stowed also told of the readiness of the sea witch to repel boarders that all these preparations had been made merely as ordinary precautions in a peaceful trade was by no means probable and yet there they were, and there stood the bright-eyed, handsome, and youthful commander upon the quarter-deck, but he did not look the desperado. Such a term would have poorly accorded with his open and manly countenance, his quiet and gentlemanly mien. A pirate would hardly have dared to lay the course he steered in these latitudes, where an English or French cruiser was very likely to cross his track. He handles a ship as prettily as ever a true blue did yet, said one of the forecastle group in replying to some remark of a comrade concerning the commander. "'That's true,' answered another. "'He seems to have a sort of natural way with him, as though he'd been born aboard and never seed the land at all. And as to that matter, there may be them on board who say as much of him.' "'That isn't far from the truth,' answered Bill Marline. "'Seeing he started so early on the sea, he can't tell when he wasn't there himself.' "'How was that matter, Bill?' asked one of his messmates. They say you've kept the captain's reckoning, man and boy, these fifteen years. That have I, and never a truer heart floated than the man you see yonder leaning over the rail on the quarter-deck, where he belongs, answered Bill Marline. How did you first fall in with him, Bill? Tell us that, said one of the crew. Well, do ye see, messmates? It must have been the matter of thirteen years ago, there or thereabouts, but I can't exactly say, seeing's I never have kept a log and can't write but must have been about that length of time, when I was a foremast hand on board the Sea Lion, as fine an Indiaman as you would wish to see. We were lying in the Liverpool docks, with sails bent and cargo stowed, under sailing orders, when one afternoon there strolled alongside a boy rather ragged and dirty, but with such eyes and such a countenance as you would make him a passport anywhere. Well, do ye see? We were lazing away time on board, and waiting the captain's coming before we hauled out into the stream, and so we coaxed the lad aboard. He either didn't know where he came from or wouldn't tell, and when we proposed to take him to sea with us, he readily agreed, and sure enough he sailed in the sea lion. "'Well, heave ahead, Bill,' said one of the group, as the narrator stopped to stove a fresh installment of the Virginia weed in his larboard cheek. "'Heave ahead!' We hadn't got fairly clear of the channel, continued Bill Marline, before the boy had become a general favorite all over the ship. We washed him up and bent on a new suit of toggery on him, with a regular tarpaulin, and there was almost a fight whether the forecastle or the cabin should have him. At last it was left to the boy himself, and he chose to remain with us in the forecastle. The boy wasn't sick an hour on the passage until after we left the Cape of Good Hope, when the flag halyards getting fouled, he was sent up to the peak to loosen it, and by some lurch of the ship was throw upon the deck. Why it didn't kill him as was the wonder of us all, but the boy was crazy for near a month from the blow on his head, which he got in falling, but he gradually got cured under our captain's care. Well, do you see, our captain was a regular whole-souled fellow, though he did sometimes work up a hand's old iron pretty close for him, and so he took the boy into the cabin and gave him a berth alongside his own and as he grew better took to teaching him the use of his instruments, and mathematics and the like. The boy, they said, was wonderful ready, and learned like a book, and could take the sun and work up the ship's course as well as the captain. But what was the funniest of all was that, after he got well, he didn't know one of us. He had forgotten or even how he came on board the ship. The injury had put such a stopper on his brain that he had forgotten all that ever occurred before it. To my mind, howled some ever, it wasn't much to forget seeing he was little better than a baby and hadn't been to sea at all and you know there ain't anything worth knowing on shore more'n one can overhaul in a day's leave more or less within hail of the sea that's true growled one or two of his messmates our ship was a first-class freighter and passage vessel 
and on the home voyage we had plenty of ladies. Twas surprising to see how natural like the boy took to em, and how they all liked him. He was constantly learning something, and soon got so he could parley voo like a real frog eaten Frenchman. And then, as I said before, he took the sun and worked up the ship's reckoning like a commodore. Well, do you see, messmates, we made a second and third voyage together in that ship, and when Master Will Rattlin, for that was the name we gave him when he first came on board, and he's kept it ever since, was a matter of fourteen years, he was nearly as big as he is now, and acted as mate. And though I say it, who ought to know somewhat about those things, I never seed a better seaman of twice his years, always saving present company, messmates. In course, Bill, growled three or four of his messmates heartily. Well, do you see, messmates, we continued together in the same ship for the matter of five years, and then Master Will and I shipped in another Indiaman, and we were in the Birmingham for three years or more. One day we lay off the Cape on the home passage, and half a dozen of us got shore leave for a few hours, and I among the rest, and somehow I got rather more grog aboard than I could stow, and when I came off, the captain swore at me like a pirate, and after I got sober, triced me up to the main rigging for a round dozen. When all hands were called to witness punishment, shiver my timbers if Master Will Rattlin, who was the first mate, didn't walk boldly up to the captain and say blunt and honest, Captain Brace, Marline is an old and favorite seaman, and if you will let this offense pass without further punishment, I will answer for his future good behavior at all times. I ask it, sir, as a personal favor. But discipline, discipline must be observed, Mr. Ratlin. I acknowledge he's in fault, sir, said our mate. And deserves the punishment, said the captain. I fear he does, sir, but yet I can't bear to see a good seaman flogged, said the mate apologetically. Nor I either, said the captain, but Bill Marline deserves the cat, though as you make it a personal matter, why I'll let him off this time, Mr. Ratlin. The captain didn't wish to let me go, but he said he wished to gratify his mate, and so I was cast loose, and after a broadside of advice and a hurricane of oaths, was turned over to duty again. I didn't forget that favor, messmates, and sink me if I wouldn't go to the bottom to serve him any time. He commanded a brig in the South American trade after that, and would have made a mate of me, but somehow I've got a weakness for grog that isn't very safe, and so he knows t'won't do. You see him there now, messmates, as calm as a lady, but he's awake when there's need of it. The man don't live that can handle a ship better than he. And as for fighting, do ye see, messmates, we were running on this here same tack, just off the, but a vast upon that. I haven't any more to say, messmates, said the speaker demurely. Bill Marline evidently found himself treading upon dangerous ground, and wisely cut short his yarn thereby creating a vast amount of curiosity among his messmates, but he sternly refused to speak further upon the subject. Either his commander had prohibited him, or he found that by speaking he should in some way compromise the credit or honor of one upon whom he evidently looked as being little less than one of a superior order of beings to himself. But what do you bring up so sudden for? Pay out, old fellow, there's plenty of sea room and no land sharks to fear, said one of the group encouragingly. Never you mind, messmates, there's nothing like keeping a civil tongue in your head, especially being quiet about other people's business, added Bill. What think you, Bill, of this present vocation, eh? asked another companion. I ship for six months, that's all I know, and no questions asked. I understand very well that Captain Ratlin wouldn't ship me where he wouldn't go himself. Well, do you see, Bill? Most of us are new on board here, though we have knocked about long enough to get the number of our mess and to work ship together, and don't perhaps feel so well satisfied as you do. Why, look ye, messmates, aren't you satisfied so long as the articles ye signed are kept by captain and crew? asked Bill Marline, somewhat tartly. Why, yes, as to that matter. But where are we bound, Bill? asked the other. Any boy in the ship can make out the sea witch's course, said the old tar evasively. We're in these here northern trades, close hauled, and heading according to my reckoning due east, and any man who has stood his trick at the will of a ship knows that such a course steered from the West Indies will, if well followed, run down the Cape Verdes. That's all I know. 
Port Praia and a port. That was in the article, sure enough, answered he who had questioned Bill Marline. But the sea witch will scarce anchor there before she is off again, according to my reckoning. That the old tar knew more than he chose to divulge, however, was apparent to his comrades, but they knew him to be fixed when he chose, and so did not endeavor by importunity to gather anything further from him, so the conversation gradually changed into some other channel. In the meantime, while the crew gathered about Bill Marline were thus speculating, the vessel bowled along gracefully, with a speed that was in itself exhilarating to her young commander, who still gazed idly at the passing current. Once or twice a slight frown clouded his features, and his lips moved as though he was striving within himself, either against real or imaginary evil, and then the same calm, placid manliness of countenance radiated his handsome features, and his lips were composed. Now he turned to issue some necessary order, which was uttered in that calm, manly distinctness that challenges obedience, and then he resumed his idle gaze over the vessel's side, once more losing himself in his daydream. End of chapter 2 Recorded by Jerry Dixon, Zephyr Hills, Florida Chapter 3 of The Sea Witch This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jerry Dixon The Sea Witch by Murray Maturin Balu Chapter 3 The Gale The wind seems to be hauling, said the mate, walking aft and addressing his superior. Keep her a good fool, said the captain, to the man at the helm. Aye, aye, sir, said the old tar, as he tried to make the sails draw by altering the vessel's course a point or two more free. Here it is, sure enough, said the captain, from the southwest. Up with the men forward once more, Mr. Faulkner. We must humor our beauty. All hands oil deck, shouted the mate at the hatch, an order which as before was perfectly obeyed. Almost as quickly as the foremast had been stripped of the square rig it had at first borne, it was once more clothed again with its topsail and mainsail, and in less than fifteen minutes the sea witch was under a cloud of canvas, with stud and sails out on both sides, while the fore and aft sails on the main and mizzen were boomed out wing and wing, dead before the wind. The stay sails and jibs were hauled down now as useless, and the vessel flew like a courser. The change of wind had brought the sea up, and the vessel had a gradual roll, causing the waves now and then to come gracefully in over the waist, while the extreme fore and aft parts of the handsome craft were perfectly dry. It has set her to waltzing, Mr. Faulkner, said his superior, but she improves her speed upon to it, and I think the breeze freshens from this new quarter. Yes, sir. Do you see the long bank of white here away to the south-southwest? It looks like a fog bank, but maybe a squall, said the mate. There are few squalls in these latitudes, Mr. Faulkner, and yet I don't like the looks of the weather in the southern board, said the captain, as he gazed to windward, with a quick searching glance. While he spoke, the wind came fresher and fresher, and now and then a damp puff and lull that were two significant tokens for a seaman to disregard. Captain Ratlin jumped upon the inner braces of the taffrail, and shading his eyes with his hands for a moment, looked steadily to windward then glanced at his well-filled sails as though he was loath to lose even a minute of such a fair wind. He delayed, however, but a second, when jumping down to the deck again, he issued his orders in those brief but significant tones of voice, which at the same time imparts promptness and confidence in a waiting crew on shipboard. In stud and sails, gaff top sails, fore royal and top gallant sails, with a will, men, cheerily, cheerily o. Oh. These were tones that the crew of the Sea Witch were no stranger to, and sounds they loved, for they betokened a thorough and complete feeling of confidence between commander and men, and they worked with spirit. "'Lay aft here, and brail the spanker up,' continued the captain promptly. "'Aye, aye, sir,' was the response of a half-dozen ready hands as they sprang to do his bidding. The vessel was thus, by the consummation of these orders, quickly reduced to her mainsail, foresail, and fore topsail, while she flew before the oncoming gale at the rate of seventeen or eighteen knots an hour, 
being actually much faster than the sea. It was now evident to everyone on board that a severe gale of wind was gathering, and its force was momentarily more powerfully exercised upon the vessel. "'She staggers under it, Mr. Faulkner,' said his superior, with a calmness that evinced perfect self-reliance and coolness, while he regarded the increasing gale. "'Aye, sir, you can drive her at almost any speed,' answered the mate. "'She's like a meddled courser, sir, and loves the fleet track.' "'Scud while you can, Mr. Faulkner. It's a true nautical rule. Some men will always heave a ship to if there's a cap fill of— "'Double reef the mainsail!' shouted the captain, interrupting himself, to give an order that he saw was imperative. "'Wind, but I believe in scudding if you can,' he added. "'Double reef for topsail, and look ye, Mr. Faulkner, have presenter sheets been on the foresail. This wind is in earnest,' said his superior, more seriously, as he jumped into the mizzen shrouds and scanned the sea to windward again. The gale still increased, and everything being now made snug on board the Sea Witch, she was run before it with almost incredible speed. It would have been a study to have regarded the calm self-possession and complete coolness of the young commander during this startling gale. He never once left his post. Every inch of the vessel seemed under his eye, and not the least trifle of duty was for a moment forgotten. If possible, he was more particular than usual that his orders in the smallest item were strictly observed, and thus with his iron will and strong intelligence he mastered every contingency of the hour, imparting that indispensable confidence among his people so requisite to perfect control. There was a firmness now expressed in the compressed lips, and a sternness in the eye, that had not before been manifested, while there was a breathing of authority in his smallest order. In an instant more the scene was changed. With terrific violence the vessel flew up in the wind with the rapidity of thought, and a report like that of a score of cannons fired at the same moment was heard above the roar of the winds. "'What lubberly trick is this?' shouted the captain, fiercely, to the old tar who held his station at the wheel, and on whose faithfulness everything depended. "'The wheel rope is parted on the larboard side, Your Honor,' was the reply. "'That is no man's fault,' said his commander. "'Bear a hand here, Mr. Faulkner, and bend on a fresh wheel-rope. "'Be lively, sir, be lively!' The sails had been blown from the bolt-ropes in an instant of time, and the vessel now lay wallowing in the sea. Now once more was seen the power of discipline and the coolness of the young commander, whose word was law in that floating community. Fifty voices were raised in shouts above the storm, suggesting this expedient and that, but that agile figure, which we have already described, sprang lightly into the mizzen shrouds, and with a voice that was heard by every soul on board the Sea Witch, shouted sternly, Silence in the ship! Not a voice was heard, and every man quietly awaited his order, looking abashed that there had been a tongue heard save his who had the right alone to speak. Cast the gasket off the foot of the fore and aft foresail. Aye, aye, sir, responded the mate who, having secured the rudder, now hastened by his commander, followed by a dozen hands to execute the order. "'Haul the sheet to port!' "'Aye, aye, sir. Belay that!' As the vessel felt the power of the canvas thus opportunely loosed and brought to bear, she gradually paid off before the wind, and once more had steerage way. Another foresail was now bent, and this time double reef, the foretop sail too, was bent, close reefed and furled while the fore and aft foresail was once more stowed, leaving the sea witch to scud under double-reefed foresail. Five days of steady blow continued before the vessel could again show more than a small portion of her canvas. Then the wind once more hauled to the northwest, and the sea witch donned air fore and aft rig on all her masts, steering close-hauled again due east, until the lofty headlands of the Cape de Verdes hove gradually in sight and the fleet clipper craft made her anchorage in the harbor of Port Praia. The sea witch, whatever her business in this harbor, seemed able to transact it without venturing inside the forts, or taking stronger moorings than a single anchor could afford her. At this she rode with mysterious quiet. Not a soul of the full complement of men on board were visible from the shore. Now and then perhaps the head of some taller hand than his fellows might loom up above the bulwarks at the waist or a solitary seaman creep quietly aloft to reeve a sheet through some block, or secure some portion of the rigging. 
The captain scarcely waited for his land tackle to hold the vessel before a quarter boat was lowered away, and with a half dozen sturdy fellows as its crew pulled boldly towards the main landing, where he stepped ashore and disappeared. A suspicious eye would have marked the manner in which the sails upon the sea witch had been secured, and the way in which she was moored. If need be, three minutes would have covered her with canvas, and slipping her cable she could in that space of time, had the order been issued from her quarter-deck, have been under way in looking once more seaward. Whatever her business, it was very clear that promptness, secrecy, and large precaution were elements of its success. Nor had these characteristics, which we have named, escaped entire observation of the people on shore, for at the nearest point of land a group of idlers were visible, who stood gazing at and discussing the character of the vessel, while at the same moment her young commander was seen with his boat's crew pulling back from the landing to his craft. His business was brief enough, for even now the anchor is once more away. The gallant ship spreads her broad wings one by one, and gracefully bending to the power of the breeze, glides like a fleet courser over the fathomless depths of the sea, while the mind that controls her motions again assumes his reverie on the quarter-deck. End of chapter 3 Recording by Jerry Dixon, Zephyr Hills, Florida Four of the Sea Witch. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jerry Dixon. The Sea Witch by Murray Maturin Ballou. Chapter 4 Bramble Park. Changing the field of our story from the blue waves to that of land, we must ask the reader to go back with us for a period of years from that wherein our story is opened, to the fertile country and highly cultivated lands in the neighborhood of Manchester, England. Sir Robert Bramble's estate was some eight miles from the large manufacturing town just named, and embraced within its grounds some of the most delightfully situated spots within a day's ride in any direction. Parks, gardens, ponds, groves, stables and fine animals in short every accompaniment to a fine english estate sir robert was a man of not much force of character had inherited his estates and had partly exhausted his income so far as to render a degree of economy imperatively necessary a fact which was not calculated to render any more amiable a naturally irritable disposition the family at bramble park as the estate was called consisted of sir robert and his lady a weak-minded but once beautiful woman and two sons robert and charles the eldest at this period some twelve years of age the youngest about nine and the usual number of servants indoors and out made up the household sir robert's could hardly he said to be a very happy household notwithstanding there seemed to be every element and requisite to be found there for peaceful domestic happiness and perhaps it would have puzzled a casual observer to have ascertained wherein laid the root of that evil, which, like a poisonous upas, seemed to spread its branches through the household. There was a cloud apparently shadowing each face there. There was constantly some trouble of a domestic character. Sir Robert and Lady Bramble seemed to be not on the best of terms with each other, and the servants wore a hangdog look as though they expected at any moment to be called to account for some piece of rascality. There was, however, one pleasant face in that household, though even that seemed tempered by sadness. This was the youngest brother, Charles. He was, or rather would have been, a cheerful happy boy, but for the malign influence of his brother Robert, who seemed his opposite in almost everything. Robert was jealous, irritable, and revengeful. Charles was open-hearted, mild, and forgiving. Robert was cruel to both servants and animals. Charles was kind to all, and a favorite with all. Even the dumb animals avoided one and adhered to the other, instinctively knowing a friend. Robert was the first-born and the favorite with his mother, whom he ruled literally in all things, while Sir Robert, looking upon him as the legal heir and representative of his name, of course considered him in a somewhat different light from that in which he regarded Charles. 
At times it seemed as though an evil spirit had taken possession of Robert's heart, and he delighted in oppressing, domineering over, and abusing his brother, who, though he did not lack for spirit, yet could never bring it to bear against Robert. He meekly bore his reproaches and abuse, and even at times had suffered personal chastisement at his hands without complaint to his parents, rather than irritate both them and himself by referring to so disagreeable a matter. With a naturally patient disposition, he suffered much without complaint. Sir Robert and Lady Bramble seemed blind to the fact that the unbounded indulgence which they yielded to their eldest child was rendering still worse a disposition and habit which were already in affliction in themselves. But Robert was persevering, and would always carry his point, let it be what it might, teasing and cajoling the mother until she granted his wishes, however absurd they might be. He domineered over every one, mother, father, servant, maids, and servant-men. He was the terror of all. Charles added to his light-heartedness and cheerfulness of spirit, great agility, and for a boy of his age remarkable strength, in which matters Robert was deficient, and here his jealousy found ample scope. Charles, too, was remarkably apt with his studies, whereas Robert generally ended his lessons by quarreling with his tutor and setting both father and mother against him, by which reason the worthy who filled that post at Bramble Park was usually changed at least once in six or eight weeks, and thus were matters at the period to which we refer. It seemed as though Robert was never happy unless he was doing someone harm or distressing some of the many pet animals about the spacious grounds. In this latter occupation he passed much of his leisure time, and was a great adept at the business. A fine St. Charles Spaniel, belonging to Lady Bramble, had one day, after being teased beyond forbearance by Robert, at last in self-defense, snapped at and lightly bit him, in revenge for which the violent-tempered boy vowed to kill him, and the very next opportunity he had, he seized upon the little pet, and tying a string and stone about its neck, bore the dog to the large pond in the center of the park, where he threw him into the deepest part. Charles at that moment came in sight, and at once saw the act. Without pausing to take off his clothes or any part of them, he sprang at once into the pond and dove down for the dog, but he found the stone about its neck too heavy for him to bring to the surface, though he struggled long and stoutly to do so before he yielded. Swimming to the shore, Charles took his knife from his pocket and once more dashed in, and this time diving down he cut the cord, and releasing the dog from the bottom, swam with him to the opposite shore from where Robert stood, all the while threatening him. Here his younger brother smoothed the water from the dog's coat, and instinctively rubbing its benumbed limbs until it became quite resuscitated, and after a short time, following close to Charles for protection, it returned to his mother's side in her boudoir. But Robert had been there before him, and had already manufactured a story redounding to Charles' discredit, and provoking both his mother's and father's anger, the latter of whom at Robert's instance even struck the gallant-hearted boy a severe blow with the flat of his hand as a punishment for what he denominated an interference with his brother's sport. Charles said nothing. He knew the prejudice which Robert's constant misrepresentations had created against him in his parents' breasts. He realized, too, young as he was, that it was useless for him to attempt to explain, though he felt the injustice of this treatment. And so with a quivering lip he turned away from the scene and went in his wet clothes to the servants' hall where he might dry them. He said nothing, but looked much sadder than usual as he stood there before the fire. A coarse but honest servant, Leonard Hust, who had been born on the estate, and whose father before him had been a servant in Sir Robert's household, came stealthily to Charles's side, and busied himself in helping him to arrange his clothes and dry them, while he smoothed the boy's hair and wiped his face. "'Never mind, Master Charles,' said the honest fellow, noticing the trembling lips of the handsome boy. "'Never mind.' It's a gallant act in you, and though I say it, who shouldn't perhaps? Master Robert never would have dared to do it. He hasn't got half your courage and strength, though he's bigger and older. A tear was all the answer that the boy vouchsafed to his honest effort at consolation. 
he too proud to make a confidant of the servant or to confide to him of his father's conduct or even that of robert leonard hust watched the boy carefully and entered keenly into his feelings until at last he said i wasn't the only one who saw you save her ladyship's pet master charles it wasn't father or mother that saw it asked charles quickly as he recalled the injustice he had just experienced at their hands under robert's prompting no master charles was it cousin helen continued the boy yes master charles answered leonard hust with a knowing smile oh said the boy as a glow of pleasure lit up his features for a moment it was evident that the knowledge of the said cousin helen's having seen his exertions to save the little favorite spaniel gave charles not a little satisfaction now cousin helen as a little blue-eyed child of eight years the daughter of the family whose estate joined that of bramble park was called was no cousin at all but the children had thus nicknamed each other and they were most happy playmates together robert who was three years his brother's senior was more fond of little helen than of anybody else indeed in spite of his ill temper he was wont to try and please her at any cost but the child who was as beautiful as a little fairy did not respond at all to his advances of friendship while to charles she was all tenderness and confiding in everything kissing him with childish fervor and truth whenever they parted a familiarity she never permitted to his brother the truth was robert to his great discomfiture was aware that charles's manly and courageous act of saving the dog had been witnessed by helen though his brother knew it not until told by leonard hust this had aggravated robert so much that he had hastened home and fabricating a story of charles having thrown the dog into the pond and wet himself completely preparing his parents for a rough reception of his brother when he should return and hence the treatment he received leonard made his young master change his clothes and after making him comfortable left him to amuse himself in the open park with his ball where the light-hearted charles was soon thoughtlessly happy and forgetful of the unkindness of robert and the injustice of his parents so light are the cares and mishaps of youth so easily forgotten are its hardships either seeming or real happy childhood whether little cousin helen had been on the watch for charlie or whether she was there by accident it matters not suffice it to say that the two soon met in their headlong career of fun and frolic and two more joyous or merry spirits never met on the soft green sward than these now they tire of the play at ball and sit down together close by the brink of the clear deep pond next the rich flower beds that shed their grateful fragrance around the spot cousin helen still panting from the exertion of the play looked thoughtfully into the almost transparent water and involuntarily heaved a sigh that did not escape her companion's notice art sick cousin helen asked charles quickly nay not i said the pleasant voiced child not i charlie but you sighed as though you were very tired or in pain he continued did i said the child thoughtfully well i believe i did and what for cousin helen said charles tenderly parting her natural ringlets back from her beautiful and radiant face doubly radiant now as she looked up into his so confidingly and so affectionately i was thinking she said ingenuously how cruel robert was to your mother's pet i don't see how he could do such a thing do you charlie robert is quick-tempered said his brother and perhaps regrets it now i guess the dog bit him or something of that sort he was too generous too manly to complain of robert's cruel treatment of him or to mention the unkindness he had experienced from his parents but he had not forgotten these occurrences and his lip once more quivered with emotion and his clear handsome eyes were suffused with tears quick as thought his little companion divined with womanly instinct the cause for she was not ignorant of the state of affairs young as she was that existed at bramble park drawing nearer to his side she threw one arm tenderly and with childish abandon over his neck and with the other brushed away the gathering tears until charles smiled again and leaned over and kissed her sweet little lips as a brother might have done 
and then together they plucked a beautiful bouquet and busied themselves in arranging it and classifying the various plants by their botanical names for both children were well versed in this delightful study young as they were while they were thus engaged robert came up and angrily discovered the two children thus happy together saying some rude things to charles he pushed him away from his playmate's side with rude and brutal force throwing charles to the ground this was too much even for his forbearing spirit and the injured and outraged boy smarting under the previous injury he had endured rose quickly to his feet and with one blow knocked robert heavily upon the ground the blow had been a severe one and the boy was faint and unable to stand for a moment charles looked at him for an instant then helped to raise him up and waited until he was again sufficiently conscious to walk then he saw him walk angrily toward the house where he knew very well what would follow on his return there all the while his little companion had stood regarding first one and then the other now charles stepped to her side and said i am sorry helen but it is very very hard to bear she shook her little head as he spoke but held up her lips for the kiss he offered and saw him turn away from home towards the distant town end of chapter four recording by jerry dixon zephyr hills florida